Well, good morning. Ooh, the mic is a little loud, or I am overzealous today. God knew we needed some sunshine today, so he gave it to us, because it is tax day, after all, and so we need a little sun as we drive to the mailbox to thank the government for everything they do for us with the money that we're giving them. So anyway, thought I'd do that. Um, second thing I wanted to let you know is that my bear is back. We had a bear come to our back door, literally, last year in the fall, and we were able to scurry him away by taking all the food away. But he, in his sleep, was dreaming about our house and came right back. So now we get to face how we're gonna deal with a bear in the spring and the summer and grandkids and chickens, etc. So more, to, you'll find out more about that. I have recipes on bear, um, how to cook. Um, but I'm in the city limits, and so I won't be doing anything that anybody will find out about. So anyway, the bear is back. My name is Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the Gresham Chamber of Commerce, the best chamber in Oregon and the Pacific Nor Northwest. So my opinion, but it is definitely that. We could not do our business and leaders luncheons without some amazing sponsorships, and I want to recognize those folks today. Our presenting sponsor is Riverview Community Bank, and welcome back, Portland General Electric. Dean, I saw you come in. Hi, Dean, thank you for being here today, and thanks for the sponsorship. Please let everyone know. We also have stakeholder sponsors, that's Gresham Barlow School District, and they're probably busy building buildings right now. We've got four new ones coming up. And I want to thank our media sponsor, Metro East Community Media, Keith Thompson, and he's trying out some new um, technology today, and so that's going to be fun. And there are replay um, flyers out on the registration table so that you can hear what you hear today, but also, if you like what you heard or aren't are confused about what you heard, you can hear it again. And so you can pick up the replay schedule. Thank you, um, Metro East, for doing that. We'd also like to um, recognize some elected officials that are in the audience today. We're going to hear from uh, Commissioner, <clears throat> from Councilor Craddock in just a minute, but we all have a newly appointed council member here, uh, Betty Dominguez. Thank you, Betty, for showing today. Appreciate that. And we have Senator Chuck Thompson here today who is going door to door in the area and said, I'm gonna knock on all those persimmon doors and get a lunch out of that chamber. So Senator Thompson, thank you very much for coming today. Um, you live in Hood River? Yeah. And your district goes where? Uh, cool, around the mountains, Cascade Lots of Stocks, and Troutville, that includes Troutville mostly, uh, ends up in near Camp Whitcomb. Almost all of Happy Valley. Then they gerrymandered it into Southeast Portland. Um, into so what he's trying to tell you, he's lost because he can't follow the boundaries of his. <laughs> Yeah, he has all of Sandy. Anyway, um, Senator, we appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Thank you very much. And I would also like to recognize the chamber board members that are with us today. Past President Warner Allen of Warren Allen LLP. Warner, thank you for being here. Jim Hathaway, who is the president-elect of the chamber. Jim, thank you very much. He's with Transamerica Financial Advisors. Dave Tachuk, who is with Adventist Health Portland. I have to make sure I say that right because I'm used to saying it very differently. Dave is a newer board member. Adventist is not, but we appreciate you coming today. And Dave will be leaving early. It doesn't have anything to do with whatever is being said at the time. He has another commitment he has to get to there. And I don't think I missed any other board members. I did in January and got in big trouble. Okay, February we were snowed out. And I'm not sure who was more disappointed, me, who was there on a holiday, which was that, that um, holiday, I just came back from vacation to snow, and I had to cancel it, or our speaker, who was Senator Packwood. Packwood, he was so determined to be here, he says, I can make it, if I can make it, anybody. I'm old, I just had a hip replaced. I can be there, I said, Bob, the parking lot is snowy. And the next day, he actually left to go south for six months, so we couldn't redo that um, particular speech. Uh, speech time. So we were snowed out la that month, and then the next month we were mayored out. Um, we had the state of the city address with our mayor. It was a phenomenal 
afternoon. The lunch was great. Our, our mayor is amazing, and his message and vision to us that day was so good. So I hope if you missed it this year that you will put it on your calendar for next year. And then we, we fast forward to today. So we have um, Metro on the docket today. Now, many of you have noticed that there are elephants on the table, and I want to be very clear that this is not a political statement. Trust me, now, how I got them might have been a political statement, but that is not why I'm using them today. We remember things sometimes as it relates to something and we don't know why, and so I did a little research on the history of, of Metro, and that's why we've got the elephants today. So I want to um, remind you how Metro became Metro. And this is the Cliff Notes version, and I'm leaving a whole lot out. None of it is a lie, but there are some pieces that may um, need to be filled in. We started with the Columbia Region Association of Governments. The acronym is CRAG, C-R-A-G, Columbia Region Associated Governments. That organization, that association met the federal requirements that transportation, housing, and sanitation planning be coordinated on a regional basis before federal funds could be allocated to improve infrastructure. So in order for infrastructure to be improved, according to the federal government, you had to be responsible for transportation, housing, and sanitation. All makes sense. And at that point in time, Craig, C-R-A-G, was responsible for that. Local governments could choose whether or not to be part of that, and that depended then on whether they got federal funds. In 1970, the legislature created the Metropolitan Service District, or MSD, which was responsible for solid waste planning and the Washington Park Zoo. I don't know why, but that they put those two things together. Well, in 1976, the National Academy for Public Administration used funds from the U.S. Housing and Urban Development to fund a tri-county local government commission. That commission, in turn, developed the proposal to merge Craig and MSD together. The creative and innovative aspect of this whole merging proposal was the direct election of a governing council of districts, from districts. And in 1977, the legislature, those people that work in Salem, or that drive to Salem, oh, that's a joke, um, approved sending the merging proposal to the voters, and they did that, and the residents of the three counties, Washington, Multnomah, and Clackamas, approved by 20,000 votes in May of 1978 that Craig and the MSD fold and they become one governing body, and that governing body later was named Metro. Now, perhaps I remember during that campaign in 1978, when they were trying to get the three county residents to merge those two, perhaps I remember Zudu, elephant poop. And I don't know why, but when I think about those times, I don't know if it was positive campaigning slogan or negative campaigning slogan, but that's what I remember at that time, it was that Metro was all about elephant poop. Okay, thus you have elephants on your table because we honor our history. And I, that's what I remember at the time. I was very young in 1978, so I, um, that also is a joke. So some of the names you may recognize in Metro's history, Rick Gustafson, the Sears store, that's where the old Sears on, on um, Grand, it was Grand at the time, they remodeled that, and then that's where Metro moved in. Mike Burton, that's another name that we may remember. The council president, who we're going to hear from today, a, a candidate for that, sets the agendas and makes appointments to all of the Metro committees, the board, and the commissions. Metro is in charge of land use planning, transportation planning, open space, convention performance venues, solid waste planning and disposal, and yes, the zoo. So having said that, they have a big responsibility, and it's not all about elephants. I can, 
I assure you, some people may feel that some forms of government are as big as elephants, but they are always manageable. They're warm and friendly. They last forever. We need to make friends with them and not be run over. And with that, I want to introduce a friend of mine. Not an elephant friend, but big in his own way. The chair of the Government Affairs Council, Brian Lessler of LPG Construction and Contracting and Making Millions of Dollars Working in Oregon and California and Washington. Is that the new name of your company? No. No. <laughs> Brian, why don't you come up and introduce our speakers for the day? Thanks, pal. Good to see you. Okay, so bears on the patio. <clears throat> I just want you to know that I know Drake Snodgrass well enough to know that there's probably going to be bear stew at their house, regardless of what Lynn says. Uh, Chief sells, you can pretend like you didn't hear that, okay? <clears throat> there are, are ways of dealing with that. We'll leave that for another day. So it's my pleasure um, to introduce Lynn Peterson. And <clears throat> I have to make a confession that Lynn and I have been trading calls for probably a couple of months now. My fault that we haven't connected. So in addition to introducing you all to Lynn, uh, I'm introducing myself to Lynn today, so i um, very happy to have you. Lynn was raised in Wisconsin by a family of educators who taught her the values of public service <clears throat> and community. These values of respecting the land and all who inhabit it have guided the work she, that she has done uh, as a nationally recognized expert in transportation and land use. <clears throat> Lynn has worked at local, state, and national levels for the past 30 years. Wow, you don't look that old. That can't be true, can it? Holy moly. <clears throat> She's delivered uh, outcomes on affordable housing, uh, transportation investment, and minority contracting. Lynn served as a secretary of the Washington State Department of Transportation with responsibilities for the state's highways, bridges, railways, and ferry systems. Uh, and that's a big job, by the way, with transportation, um, I'm sorry, uh, and is now an advisor to transportation departments across the country. Previously, she has served as Oregon Governor Kitzhaber's transportation policy advisor, uh, where she directed transportation policy, statewide transportation funding discussions, and the implementation of community priorities. In 2008, she became the first elected chair of Clackamas County Commission. <clears throat> Lynn holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering from University of Wisconsin. Um, she also holds two master's degrees from Portland State University in Civil and Environmental Engineering and Urban and Regional Planning. See what happens when you grow up in a family of educators. <clears throat> Lynn, if you're elected, will you be the first woman to serve as Metro president? Whether the answer is yes or no, Lynn wants to bring a bold leadership to Metro. Please welcome Lynn Peterson. Thank you. It's good to meet you. It's good, to meet you. good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. How you doing? Um, I am running, my name is Lynn Peterson, I am running for Metro Council President, and yes, uh, somebody needs to be Madam President, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I just want to kind of go a little bit through why I'm running for Metro Council uh, today, a little bit about me, a little bit about where I think we're going, uh, maybe put some ideas out there that uh, get you thinking about the future, and then start that conversation. So uh, I know a lot of you are probably native to Oregon, but a lot of us also moved to Oregon and we fell in love with it when we came. I fell in love with it based on my background, uh, based on the fact that really what this entire region is about and what Metro is about is strong communities. And what I've seen over the years and where I see us going, uh, I'm very concerned. There's a lot of disparity within our region, a lot of uh, investment has gone into certain parts of our region, but has passed over other parts. So we need to really be cognizant of, of how we move forward. 
But we also have 90 people moving here a day. 90 people moving here a day. And throngs of people moving out to Scapoose, Newburgh, Dundee, Canby, Molala, Cascade Locks has seen huge increase in single family permit um, homes. Uh, and that's not bad for those communities. Right? They needed that investment, they needed that energy. That was part of the plan for our region when we started the 2040 vision. But we need to have a, a bigger plan for how we're gonna handle the fact that all those folks are moving out for affordable housing, and then they're spending more time on our roads with a 25% increase in congestion from 2013 to 2015, and you all have felt it even more than that, but that's what we have numbers on for now. So um, we're in danger of losing uh, the quality of life that we have, the affordability of this region, and we're in danger of losing all that we hold dear. And so uh, I know that I didn't work the last 25 years in this region just to end up having our communities become gated communities for the privileged. And I think we're gonna have to work really hard to figure out how we go back to that strong community where we are safe, it's healthy, and it's economically vibrant for everybody. So just a little bit about me quickly. Um, I decided I wanted to go into civil engineering when I was 12. Never moved off that course and ended up working for Wisconsin Department of Transportation as a highway design and construction engineer at the age of 18. At 19, after a conversation we'll have in a second, I decided I wanted to be a DOT director someday. So that's, <laughs> that's why when Governor Inslee called when I was working for Governor Kitzhaber and said, do you want to come run my Department of Transportation? I think the answer was hell yes. So uh, the, the reason I wanted to be a, uh, an engineer is because I wanted to solve problems. I'm very much into finding the most cost-effective way, and I can tell you that now, but the most cost-effective way to get as much investment out into community as possible, and that's what I've focused my entire 30 years on, is how do we make sure that we don't overbuild in one community so we can get more safety projects and more communities faster? And so that's really what I've spent my entire journey doing. But it started out questioning why uh, Wisconsin DOT was uh, directed by the new secretary of the Department of Transportation to take a two-lane rural roadway for 70 miles and make it a divided interstate. Uh, basically, if you know Wisconsin at all, Madison sits lower central, southern central, um, and Chicago, for you, is over here. <laughs> Chicago, whoops, Chicago plays in the Wisconsin Dells every summer, just north of Madison by 70 miles. He's a former he was a former businessman from the Wisconsin Dells and decided that we not only needed I-90 to get directly from Madison up there, but we needed another um, alternative route. It was proposed um, out of the blue. It was not something that our region had ever thought would be a project. And so for me, it came out of the blue as a big surprise as the traffic safety engineer for the region. It was also a surprise that the reason given was that we needed, um, it was a safety problem. After that announcement was made, I was directed to go and do the fatal study, the fatality studies for the last 10 years on that roadway after the announcement that it was, a, it was an awful, horrific, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> being an engineer, I, I was not into uh, politics at that time. I didn't understand why. Every single farmer for the entire 70 miles created a handmade uh, plywood sign in their front yard decrying the DOT as the devil. Why? Because their farm would be decimated. Historic farmhouses would be taken out, historic barns, historic accesses would be changed. Uh, you know, their whole way of life would, would change. And we had never talked to them. But in that fatal analysis, I can tell you that over 10 years, the majority of the uh, fatalities, and I would hope that you never any of you, um, of course the chief probably has had her background in this, ever have to read a fatal report. And um, kudos to those who are on the front lines who have to deal with the actual, but to have to read the aftermath is, is uh, it, it, it changes you forever. The majority of the deaths along those highways were DUIs. Does that surprise you in Wisconsin? <laughs> Shouldn't. <laughs> um, and what I started to question in myself is how, how, how do I as the engineer, how do I problem solve out of that? That, that's a problem that I can't engineer my way out of. I, that, that's, a, that's a complex social issue that we need to have a different conversation about. And how does that impact all those farmers then when you make a decision about safety 
uh, based on something that is not, you can't engineer your way out of. So that's, that started my journey of, okay, so how, how do we actually use transportation dollars to invest in communities? And uh, that has been the journey ever since um, and why uh, I ended up on the path that I did. I ran for Lake Oswego City Council in one um, because I was looking for where, do, where in the decision-making process can I be of the most impact so that when we do build a transportation project, we're doing it within the context of the environment that we're in, whether that be a rural context, whether that be a suburban context, or whether that be a very urban Main Street context. There are different conversations that need to happen at each of those levels and different values that each of those communities hold that you need to recognize and hold true to so that you can actually achieve economic vitality, safety, and health. Otherwise, you miss the point of actually investing in transport, because why do we do transport projects? Why do we do them? Get around, but what more specifically, to link land uses. We're trying to move people from one spot to another spot, and every time you make an investment, that is an investment in that community, but if you do it uh, without thought to the land that you're going through, you actually bring the rest of the community down. So you've provided access here, but you've decreased access in other places or cut communities in half or actually created unsafe conditions if you're not thinking. And so that's, that's why I do what I do on a daily basis. So when I started uh, in this region and came to Portland and, and uh, totally immersed myself and now baked into my DNA the Oregon Land Use Planning Program, of which is one of the many priorities that uh, Metro oversees, I uh, was taught as a young land use transportation planner that in this region we do things incrementally. So we build five miles of light rail every five years. We don't do massive transportation system investments. When we look at building an interchange, we'll do one portion of that interchange, maybe every 20 years or more. Uh, we'll look at what the, the highest volume is, and we'll tackle that one problem, and that will get us to a complete transportation system someday. Uh, what it did, though, is it meant that we did a couple of small investments in a couple of places over the region over the last 30 years, but we haven't done any major systematic investments to actually move the needle in every community. What that means now with 90 people moving here a day is that we can't keep up. If we continue to think incrementally, we will not be able to either provide for affordable housing in this region or get people to where they need to go in a predictable manner. Because I can tell you right now, I can't solve congestion in an urban area, but I can certainly make it more predictable. I can certainly make it more affordable. I can give you more options, right? So that's what we're gonna have to really think about as we move into the future. And I think that the Metro Council today, and we'll hear from um, Councilor Craddock, who I'm excited to work with, uh, on uh, what, what, what they're thinking about for this fall, but, you know, when, when we see the homeless camps in downtown, when I go to meetings and ask people, you know, how many of you are actually affected by this affordable housing crisis, and I hear the stories, we were just at a Willamette Women Democrats candidate forum in uh, just uh, Lake Oswego, Tualatin area, and a woman came up to me and said, I, I'm affected. I lived in Lake Oswego my entire adult life. My medical bills got out of hand. I had to sell my house. I would love to age in place, but I'm now in a hotel. And my, my money's gonna run out soon. Those are people who are in crisis and they're at the tipping point. Either they're gonna get help and they don't slide into homelessness or they end up in homelessness. And I see um, our, our appointed counselor, uh, Betty Dominguez, shaking her head in agreement. It, truly is um, affecting everybody in our region. So when I look at that and I think about how we're going to help the guy who I met on the plane who lives in Gladstone and has been commuting to Hillsborough for almost his entire adult life, loves Gladstone, loves his jobs that he's had in Hillsborough, but his commute has gone from 45 minutes one way to an hour and a half one way, right? We've isolated a lot of our communities as well. So he's looking to try and move to the other side of the region, but probably won't be able to afford housing on that side. So I want us to create, as we move forward, a clean, green, equitable, 
and affordable region. And it doesn't just happen. We're going to have to really fight it for it this time. This isn't going to have to happen incrementally. We're going to have to think big. So I'm excited that Metro is looking at putting a, an affordable housing bond measure on this fall. And hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, and I am also excited that Metro has decided with the rest of the region that 2020 is when a transportation package will go on the ballot. Um, and what I have been talking uh, to folks about is thinking big when we think about what we're going to do with this transportation package. In the past, we've gone for one project on the ballot or we've gone for a couple projects and then we wait another 20 years. And I don't think we can afford to just do one, two, three, even four projects. I think we're going to have to think systematically. When you look at what other regions are doing around us that we're competing against, look at LA, $175 billion spent that they're going to spend over the next 20 years. Now, they got real significant problems, right? But they're going to spend half of that on roads and half of that on transit over the next 20 years. And there's no end to that funding mechanism. They will keep going. So they're giving more and more access to their port. They're giving more and more access to their employment areas. They are really thinking this through and getting transit where it needs to go and linking up so that they can remain competitive. Otherwise, companies will start to move. Puget Sound just passed $55 billion in light rail system improvements over the next 20 years and a $16 billion transportation roads package that I helped get passed up there. I want you to think about that in comparison to the $5 billion that we just passed at the state, which was the most we've ever done, <laughs> $5 million. But we are getting two or three projects out of that for the region, two or three projects. Now, we got a lot of maintenance money, which we needed. We needed that money, right? How many of you agree we needed maintenance money on our roads? There we go. Um, but uh, we're going to need more in order to be uh, competitive. Denver, uh, Salt Lake. It does not matter what region you talk about, they have made significant, significant uh, investments in their transportation system with the knowledge that it has to go to roads and transit uh, to move their region forward. So when I start to look around and see what, what we need to actually compete against uh, in terms to keep our community vibrant, uh, then we start thinking about big dollars, right? Because if we only talk about a couple projects, you're actually in the two to three to four billion dollars just with three to four projects. So what would it take to look at an entire transportation system plan and implementing it over the next 20 years? Um, I would like to put out there that Metro has uh, estimated between water, sewer, and transport that we have a $20 billion infrastructure need over the next 20 years. Yeah, that's normally what, the, that's normally the face I get. <laughs> You just went wide-eyed on me, but $20 billion. Um, and if we just look at our transport system, that's actually under a financially constrained scenario, assuming we don't get any more money usually. And so uh, it, it's actually a $20 billion just on the transportation side if you take the holistic approach. So how do we get that money out and how do we make a difference in people's lives? We start talking about corridors, not projects. How do I get you signal progression so that I can get you from one end from downtown all the way out to Forest Grove on TV Highway? How do I make sure that 180 se 181st, 182nd corridor becomes a reality? How do we make sure that 122nd becomes a reality? We do not have a full grid of arterial system out on the east side and that's one of the reasons our interstates don't work because we don't have that many options. So how do we make sure that those multimodal corridors are also, since we have capacity to move people and freight in those corridors, we also have capacity to put people to live there in workforce housing. So I'm not talking about low income, although we need that. There is a huge demand for workforce housing, and we could get people to where they need to be, which is back inside the urban area, as close to the jobs, as close to school, and as close to medical as we can get them. That's where they need to be, because the minute we shorten up their commute, that's less congestion for all of us. So uh, we need to really think about how we're going to do that. So that's, that's basically what I've been talking to a lot of the folks uh, individually in the audience about, and I'm putting forward as uh, the conversation starter is what I call the 2020-20 plan. So 20 corridors over, tw over the next 20 years for $20 billion. It's, it's a conversation starter. We can talk about what that gets us, 
where that money would come from. Uh, and I'm sure that over the next two plus years, that conversation will take a roller coaster ride of a conversation about how to do it. Uh, but we got to start somewhere. And starting small uh, is not where we need to be. No more incrementalism. We have to do bigger and we have to do better. And that's why Metro is so important for the future. That's why I'm running. Metro does two things. It brings people together to solve regional problems that our individual cities, our individual communities, our individual counties they is, are important and are above what they can handle themselves. And then we need to implement it. And in the past, Metro has done a really good job planning and a good job getting everybody to the table. But it is now for the first time that the region is saying, but we need you to help us implement. We can't do it alone. So I'm excited about the future. I'm excited that we're at this point to have this conversation. I'm excited about the possibility, and I look forward to conversations with you. We can do this, and we can do it together. So thank you, and I ask for your vote in May 15th. Thanks. Lynn, would you take a few questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any questions for Lynn Peterson? You're not leaving because... Okay, he's going and to the bathroom. Because 20 okay, billion so that's on tape mine. forever. Um, any questions for Lynn before she exits the stage? Betty? Well, mine isn't so much questions. Excuse me. Um, Don't surprise me. <laughs> I'll be good, I promise, I promise. Um, Lynn mentioned the affordable housing bond that's going on the ballot, we hope, in November. Metro Council will be deciding on it in June. I don't think there's anybody in this room that doesn't know I've been working affordable housing issues for 20 years. I've presented to this body on that before. We're in agreement in terms of what we need to do to serve the underprivileged and, and underserved communities throughout the region. And so I'm here really, I, what I wanna say today is sort of make a plug to encourage you to vote yes on that GEO bond when it comes on the ballot. We do need to be able to spread um, housing for the working for poor and affordable housing throughout the region. I know that a lot of folks out here feel like you've had sort of an undue burden. So let's see what we can do about getting it on the ground in other communities. And then also in tandem will that will, with that will be a constitutional amendment which will allow a change in ownership, meaning that government and Metro won't have to own the units, and that change in ownership then allows nonprofits who will be part of the public-private partnership to leverage other state and local and federal funds, and when that happens, we can produce twice as many affordable housing units, so please vote for the bond and vote for the constitutional amendment. In November. Thanks. In November, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that wasn't a question, obviously, right? I didn't hear there. I know, I know, I know. But is there is there someone in the room that would like to ask a question? There we go. Okay. So when you talk about um, transit, you talk about transit and roads. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about moving people, because I think in business, as you talk about getting across town, my yeah. son is working in construction. And so when he's asked to deliver something and he's in there for, so wh how do you define what the difference is between where transit, where I think of our mm -hmm. train system versus roads? Where is that divide? What is the mindset between which one takes the lead and how they work together? So you know, it really depends on the corridor. If you're talking Columbia Boulevard, that's a completely different conversation about the right mix of bus, bike ped, freight, commute. But what we actually have to do is look at uh, what the land uses are now, what the land uses are in the future, what do we want that core to look like. Um, if you have a moment to, um, you know, kind of just go on the web, the, the, the National Association of City Transportation Officials has an amazing website uh, about how to change a street depending on what the land uses are and what, what the mix of traffic is and how you can envision um, over time, over a 20 year period, uh, changing that road from uh, w what the majority of our arterials are owned by ODOT, right? So when you think about TV Highway, when you think about McLaughlin Boulevard, when you think about 82nd, uh, Sandy used to be owned by ODOT and was transferred to the city of Portland. They don't manage our arterials the way an urban area manages their own arterials. They manage them as overflow. I, ran a Department of Transportation, I know exactly how this works. Um, they manage it as, as basically their overflow pipe for when I-5 backs up, for when I-205 backs up, for when 84 backs up. They don't manage it as we would manage it to move people all day, every day. Um, they don't want a whole bunch of development on there, 
right? Because so what we need to do is to start thinking about these things in the, as a system. And many of you know when you get backed up on 84 and you type into Google, is there another way? Where does it send you? It sends you to these roads, right? Um, and we need, we need these roads to be working better. They need to be in better condition and they need to be safer, which is, a, I think, a, a, something that we really need to talk about in terms of uh, Metro making a declaration. I'm looking at Shirley. <laughs> um, uh, the city of Portland, a lot of the cities within the region have uh, looked at whether we should have Vision Zero with a goal within the next 20 years to make sure we have zero fatalities, whether that be bike, whether that be ped, or whether that be by vehicle. And I think we should. I don't think there should be any question. This region should be adopting a Vision Zero for every roadway inside to make sure that we are thinking about how people move safely. Um, and, uh, it, it, and again, the measures that you put in there, the engineering that you put into that right of way is different depending on what the corridor is supposed to be doing. Yes. How do electric, I'm sorry. <laughs> how do uh, cars such as, or systems such as Uber and or people, cars where they're not gonna have drivers or? Yeah, autonomous vehicles. Yeah, yeah. how does mm -hmm. that factor in? Oh, in so many different ways. Um, I, you know, I'm, um, I'm a big Uber Lyft supporter. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't hide that fact, um, but there are issues. There's, there's the good, right? There's the on-demand services. Uh, in fact, I think that um, uh, when you look at, at, at the confluence of transit and uh, these, these shared um, types of services, it's offering more people other options, and some of it is, a, is pretty affordable. Uh, some of it can be last mile, so when you think about the last bus stop may not get you all the way to where you need to be, you can call an Uber, right, and make that last distance because Tri might, might not have a shuttle. The business, like um, Nike, may not have a shuttle for that, but uh, w w it can extend the transport system. It's also in competition with the transit system. And a part of the reason why there's been a dip in ridership nationwide is because there's a bit of competition between the two. People are like, well, I could just take this. It's easier, it's on demand, right? I can afford it. Um, but 40% of all jobs in the United States that are related to transportation, and we've got folks in the room who <laughs> have operators out there all day, 40% uh, of those jobs could go away because of automation. So when you start thinking about 100% vehicle automation for the future, trucks are at the cutting edge. We are potentially going to see a lot less jobs for people who need good wages, that middle class type job. Those are gonna to start to go away. What are they gonna be replaced by? Um, another positive is safety. Even though we had a recent issue with, with one of the cars, uh, the, the upside of safety is huge, right? Um, but the, on the backside, having full automation means that there's gonna be the potential for you to tell your car to go pick up the pizza. And you can have your car go pick up your kid. So you're gonna actually increase vehicle miles traveled so congestion could increase. So there's like, there's a lot we don't know about, but what I can tell you is that Metro is on the cutting edge of having this conversation and coming up with policies ahead of time, because it could also create sprawl. It could create people wanting to live in Salem, Vancouver, all the way north, because they could work on the way to work. So we have, we have some big issues, and Metro is looking at um, what, what could those policy, uh, policies be for the future and how we deal with this automation that is coming. It is coming. Lynn, we're gonna have one more question and then we'll go on okay. to our next speaker. I could talk about that in roundabouts all day. There we go, yeah. No, no roundabout people here? <laughs> uh, Lynn, you talked about balance uh, in your 2020-20 plan <clears throat> and the incremental process that's been going on for the last several decades, actually. Um, there was a recent, uh, I believe it was Echo Northwest that uh, wrote a pretty good study on the economic loss that uh, results from the gridlock that we have throughout mm -hmm. the Portland metro area. Mm -hmm. uh, it amounted to hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Um, <clears throat> you only have to try to approach 
I-5 from I-84 or 205, uh, you know, uh, during any of the rush hours or pretty much any time of the day now mm -hmm. to, to realize what's going on. I'm in the construction business. In procurement, you know, we now have to talk with suppliers uh, and distributors about when they're going to deliver mm -hmm. because it's so costly for them to try to get through the city yeah. during rush hour that, that it, it impacts their ability to get materials yep. to job sites. The question is, over the last several decades, the vast majority of transportation dollars has been spent on, on railroads. Unfortunately, we can't move workers or materials on light rail. How do you assure us that there's going to be some sort of balance mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and, and, and that there will be a change in mindset with respect to surface transportation? It's a good question because it's a, it always is a balance because guess what, everybody needs a road to move. Um, the, the, the light rail obviously on its own exclusive right away, but we all for every other mode, whether it be when I bike, when I walk, when I take my car, we all need that road. So uh, one of the things that, uh, in, in terms of congestion in this region, uh, the one thing that I do uh, nationally is what I call in termed practical solutions. And so that's not, basically what that is, is not looking for the gold-plated long-term big capacity vision, but trying to deal with the congestion that you have right now within the zero to five year time frame, and going out and actually doing what you can. Because a lot of what a, a state DOT and some, uh, the cities are less likely to do this because uh, their staff are right there living with you in the congestion and they find innovative ways to, to make things happen. But at state level, they tend to wait for the 20, 30, 40 year solution, which could be billions of dollars. Um, and they, they put off some of the cheap things that they could do in the meantime, thinking that you won't, you won't want to invest in your highway system anymore if they actually fix it for the short term. It's, it's an interesting mindset. So uh, what we've been doing is uh, finding, instead of waiting for the $10 million or $100 million fix, we would go out as soon as we learned that there was a safety issue, and we would do the $100,000 fix. So sometimes, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of people think that they're traffic engineers, and most of the time they, they uh, aren't quite understanding traffic flow. <laughs> um, but uh, there's, there's a lot of folks that can recognize when you've got a, a choke point and there appears to be some space on the side of the road, the, the um, that maybe we could use. At WashDOT, we use that for uh, on shoulder, we called it um, on shoulder running of buses for express buses. And so CTRAN has started to do that coming into the region. Uh, you can't run cars and trucks on it because it's not actually built to withstand the impact, but a bus every 30 minutes, every hour, uh, an express bus, you can certainly do that and give some priority to folks. You can also just change striping and get you to merge over quicker and not have a, a large congestion point. And that, again, that's a $100,000 fix. We aren't doing those kinds of things. We're not even looking for those types of solutions right now. And I can guarantee you when I get to Metro, we will start looking for those solutions at Metro and then talk to ODOT and then find the money to make it happen. Because I don't think we can wait. We can't wait. When there's a safety issue, we should not be waiting for tens of million dollars to fix a safety issue. We should go out and figure out how we can do it tomorrow. So that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, demand management. Demand management takes the form of uh, several different things between um, the, the simple, which is uh, providing other options or different time, suggesting people take a different time, to congestion pricing, which I know that we're starting to have a conversation in this region, and I oversaw the tolling program and congestion pricing program at WashDOT, and it made a huge difference for congestion within the Puget Sound region. Now, it still has congestion problems, but it makes it a more predictable travel time if you want to pay for it. So we, we, we need to start having that conversation, and we need to figure out uh, what it is we actually value in this region. Um, if you value your travel time, you're going to need to pay for it because there's no other way to do it but to manage a lane, um, an express lane, so to speak. Um, the only way to do that is to have people pay. So but then what do we do with the money? 
then we need to figure out how we're going to invest that money. And that money is dedicated to roads and roads only. So what are our priority investments? What roads are our priority investments? Um, so I think we, we, got a, we got a big conversation ahead of us, and I'm excited to continue that with you. Before we applaud Lynn for um, coming today and braving the storm, the sunny storm we have in Gresham, <laughs> um, I, all of you heard what she said, the four components, and one of those components was affordable housing. Betty brought it up too. Please change the way we say that. It's not affordable housing, albeit affordable housing is necessary. It's housing that is affordable. Correct. Because my guess is the person that you described that lives in Gladstone, that works in Hillsborough, mm -hmm. doesn't need a low-income house. Nope. They need something they can afford. Yep. Very different dynamic. Housing that's affordable yep. is different than our mental of affordable housing. So You're correct. Good, Thank you. Good luck on your campaign. Did she do a good job? Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate it very much. Brian, will you take the stage? Our next speaker, I'm very happy to introduce um, my old neighbor, Shirley Craddock. She came to office uh, with a set of goals for District 1, uh, as she has worked to achieve throughout her time as a Metro Counselor. Her goals center around increasing economic prosperity uh, in the eastern part of the region while protecting natural resources um, in the area and the environment, increasing jobs, fostering vibrant and active town centers. <clears throat> I know Shirley is a very, very busy woman because I see her everywhere. Uh, in her capacity as Metro Counselor, she serves on the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation, JPAC, so I know that she and Lynn will have many robust conversations. She also serves on the Oregon Zoo Foundation Board, uh, Nature in Neighborhoods Capital Grants Selection Committee, that's a mouthful, um, th there must be an acronym for that, so I'll, I'll work that out later. Uh, the Travel Portland Board, and I know numerous other committees. She's a very dedicated public servant. Shirley holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Dietetics and Institutional Management from Oregon State University, go Beefs. She is the past, I'm a duck by the way, I just threw that in. Uh, she's the past president of the Oregon Dietetic Association, as a matter of fact. Uh, Counselor Craddock is married to, it says Richard Craddock, but we always call him Dick, so. Uh, retired Assistant Superintendent Davis of the David Douglas School District. She and Dick have lived in Gresham since 1979. Uh, Dick and Shirley have two daughters, Emily and Amy. Um, Counselor Craddock is an avid runner, and I can attest to that because I used to see her every morning going down, you're going down the middle of Hogan Road. What are you doing out there? Um, She's competed in many road races uh, for over 33 years, including the Hood to Coast. She loves to garden and read. Please welcome former Gresham City Councilor and current Metro Councilor Shirley Craddock. Well, thank you very much for this invitation today to join Lynn and to be able to reintroduce myself to the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm really honored to be able to represent the east part of the region at Metro. I, similar to what the comments that Lynn has made, I value the role that Metro plays in the region because I really think it can bring significant benefit, particularly to this side of the region. And that's what has motivated me to be in public office and to be attend all these multiple meetings that we all get to um, be involved in. Uh, my, as, as Brian was saying, my husband and I have lived here close to 50 years. I have to, we have to um, admit how old we are now. We raised our girls here. Uh, our roots are firmly planted here. 
we've had the opportunity. We could have moved other places of the region, uh, but we chose to live here and stay here because we really value it. Uh, where it's so we have the beautiful. It's such a beautiful area. We sit amongst the boring lava buttes. We are close to the Columbia Gorge. We're very close to Mount Hood, and we're able to get up to and get and <clears throat> get up to. Uh, recreational activities up on the on the mountain and then just in a, within a few minutes we have farmland around us so it's really a beautiful part of the region to live and, and to work and I really want to make sure that we continue to make it the best, the best place to live and bring your business and I, I always tell a story about <clears throat> I'm the same guiding principles that motivated me to run for the Gresham City Council in 2004 continue to motivate me in the role that I, I play at Metro and I always have, the only way I can really describe it is uh, by telling a story. And um, so let's say two strangers are in downtown Portland. One of them has lived here for many years. The other is new to the area. And they start up a conversation. And the person that's new to the area asks the other person, well, where should I live? We're, uh, we're going to move here. Where would be the best place to live? And where would be the best place for me to um, cite my business? And I want the answer to be the east part of the metro region. That is, the, that is the guiding principle that, that influenced every decision and every vote I take and when I sit on the Metro Council. I want to bring benefits here so we all are, we all are, are successful, are, we thrive, uh, we have the best schools, uh, we have um, businesses that are doing well, uh, people really enjoy living here, we have recreational opportunities available to us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want jobs here, so there's a, people we can live here and um, um, you know be able to not work and live in the same area. Did something fall? <laughs> and I want our transportation system to be able to get us around. And of course, Lynn's going to help us do that. And I want to make sure we have clean water and healthy streams. And be, wouldn't it be something that we could return salmon to these urban streams that we have in the east part of the region? So this is, these same aspirations that influenced me are still influencing me now, and it's, it, it guides everything that I do. Um, so, the, so what are we working on in the east part of the region? Uh, well, the first, first of all, the, um, the, we've been able, thanks to you, the voters in the region, we've um, been able to purchase over 5,000 acres in the east part of the region alone to protect over in, in perpetuity for to protect those vistas, to protect our streams, have healthy habits. If you look out the windows in this in this building, you're going to be looking at some of those properties, and they're there forever to be protected. We in 2012, the group of jurisdictions in East Multnomah County, the four Multnomah, the four East Multnomah County cities. Um, ODOT, TriMet, Metro, uh, Multnomah County all worked together and identified a group of transportation projects that we're going to work on over the next 20 years to construct. That's called the East Metro Connection Plan. And it's working together as a group of jurisdictions to say these are the most important projects where we're going to put our funding. Without that, you don't get the money. And so by doing that, we've already had uh, many of those, uh, those projects are already in the, in the process. The Division Transit Project, the first bus rapid transit system that we're going to be building in the Portland metro region. We have the money available now. We have the rating. It's now the next step is to um, begin in the design phase. The Halsey Corridor Project, the three East Multnomah County cities, then Multnomah County and TriMet and ODOT again and Metro are all working together to identify what, are the new, what new forms of development can we build along this, this route this area to really create a thriving area along the, uh, with, um, in the three cities, Trout, or Troutdale and Wood Village and Fairview. Uh, we're creating better connections from between I-84 and Highway 26. For years, the uh, Multnomah County cities argued amongst each other. They each wanted a highway similar to Highway 217 that would connect I-84 and Highway 26, but, every, but each city wanted it in somebody else's city. They could never come to an agreement where this road was going to be put. And so they finally came to an agreement through the, via the East Metro Connections Plan that we're not going to build that road because it, it destroys neighborhoods as opposed to uh, invigorates neighborhoods. Instead, we have four arterials that we're going to focus on that we're going to connect those, uh, those two um, highways together. And so right now, the city of Gresham is working on what they call the Columbia to the Clackamas, connecting 181st, 182nd, 190th, 
90th back to 172nd, make it a five lane road all the way from between Highway 212 and I-84. City of Gresham is looking at widening Hogan uh, in downtown Gresham that will make it a, a, lane, a route that you can also get from I-84 and go all the way to high, Highway 212. We already have uh, 257 slash Keene Road that is already a five lane road that connects and if any of you drive that you recognize it definitely is it is the, the, the freight traffic has really figured it out how they can get from one route to the other. And we're also working on 207th and 223rd. The city of uh, Gresham has also been focusing on the Gresham Vista. Those routes along that, uh, that uh, area is really important to be able to make sure that freight can get in and out. We're working on Sandy Boulevard. Uh, the, four, the cities have been working together. Each city has a piece of Sandy Boulevard, Gresham, Fairview, Wood Village, or uh, Wood Village doesn't, but um, Troutdale does. And so how do we improve that, the amenities along that road because to make sure we have access to the, the significant industrial area that we have in the Columbia Corridor? Uh, we're, cr we're creating the discussion about housing, as both uh, Betty and Lynn have mentioned. We have to fix our housing challenge. Without that, we can't move on any other projects in the region until we get this housing figured out. Everyone deserves a place to live. The f if you're going to be successful, children be, do well in school. The most important thing that we need to make sure that's available to them is a good place to live. Then we begin on, the, for those people that are, have other challenges, we begin on the other challenges that they have, is helping them find a job, helping them with mental health issues, helping them with uh, services that'll get them back on their feet. We're continuing to work with the conservation organizations, like Min, Lynn mentioned. The Oregon Zoo is just not a place to go and have a good time, which I always enjoy going up there. It's really a, a fun place to be. It's, it's very rewarding to see all the new amenities that have been built there and, and new habitats. But it's really about conservation. The animals that are at the Oregon Zoo are animals that are, are um, really have concerns that they're going to continue to survive in this world. They're, uh, in, they're at risk for being extinct. Asian elephants, the California condor, in, in the 1970s, they, the, for the, when the uh, Endangered Species Act was passed, that was the first animal that became protected. There were 21 of them left in the world. And so they brought them all into captivity. There are now three places now that breed California condors, and the Oregon Zoo is one of those places. It's at a remote facility. I have never been there. Nobody gets to go there because they, the bird, they don't want to have the bird's imprint on humans. And so they use video cameras, and they use robots, and they, so the birds never have accident, never see a human while they're at the facility. And when they're ready to be um, released, they're taken down to the Grand Canyon, they're taken into California, along the Big Sur coast, and released. We continue to monitor them. They have GPS uh, 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 tags on them. And so we know that when they're beginning to struggle, we can bring them back in. Because the reason why they were almost extinct in the first place, that problem is still here, is using lead ammunition. They eat carrion, they eat dead animals that have been shot with guns or with bullets. And when they eat that, those are lead fragments that uh, is um, really impacts their health. So that is, we're still working on that and trying to figure out what we're going to do in the future. And working with our um, our community, our um, you know, hunters and, the, and, and people that fish and help them and begin to help them maybe begin to think about moving from lead ammunition to another form of ammunition. We're um, continuing to uh, work a bit, uh, time to really be think about the urban growth boundary. As Lynn mentioned, we have people, 90 people a day, you said, I think it was, 100 people a day are moving here. We know as our, our, our population is going up about 1% per year. So how do we make sure there's adequate land for to live in houses, to have businesses, and for industrial land? And so we'll be beginning to have that discussion in the end of this year. I want to work with the city of Troutdale and their urban renewal plan. I want to work with the city of Gresham and to, to get, begin the construction of the Rockwood Triangle. They're very close. It's going to be very soon. I want to work with the uh, Port of Portland and the city of Troutdale and beginning to continue to bring more, more businesses to the Troutdale Reynolds property. I want to work with the city of Wood Village to improve their town center and the, and the, and the city of Gresham to complete the Gresham Fairview Trail that will connect the Springwater Trail with the Marine Drive Trail or the 40 Mile Loop Trail. Over 3 million people each year use the 40 mile loop trail. 
It's a tourist attraction. People come and visit the area just so they can, and they can use the trail systems. I want to support um, the city of Troutdale and the work they're doing on the 40 mile loop trail along the Sandy River. They are um, looking for funds to be able to construct the trail that will not only uh, connect to the 40 mile loop trail, but will connect to the historic Columbia River Highway State Trail. I want to continue working with our hoteliers and begin in, uh, in travel Portland to make the Portland metro area one of the best places to visit. We've been so fortunate. We finally got the hotelier support to build the Hyatt Hotel. And it is um, out of the ground now. And we already have 30 conventions have been, um, res have been have made reservations to come to Portland after that hotel is, is complete. I want to continue to work on our solid waste plan. We are, and we're close to be getting that finished and letting our new contracts for the next 10, 15 years on where we're going to send our, our garbage, how we're going to haul the garbage. But we also are the next thing to tackle is the challenges we're having with recycling. Metro has that responsibility. We're really, we're really having in some challenges right now. I need to figure out what we're going to do about that. I want to work with our ethnic communities to help that make sure that we all have the op opportunity to achieve our goals and, and our aspirations. And I want to work <clears throat> with our, uh, um, with Mount Hood Community College to figure out what can what Metro do to help them be uh, an, or, uh, an education facility that really is inviting and more people want to go to school there. They are the key to the for, for us to help our students uh, have get jobs and career, and be more career oriented. Want to work with the city of Happy Valley and as they annex land that was formerly in the city of Damascus, and begin to help them figure out what they're going to do and how they move forward in their future plans for their city. So there's lots to do. We want to work with our venues and begin to think about what are the new venues that we want to bring to this Portland metro area um, in, regarding performing arts or even new spectator sports. So that's my goal. That's what I enjoy doing. That's what makes me really want to get up every morning. And I really appreciate having the chance to work with those people that live and work in my district. And so thank you very much for your interest today. So, Shirley, can you answer some questions? I can, okay. yes. And I don't know if Lynn wants to join me here. Or... <laughs> so, question for Councillor Craddock. I've answered all your questions. Okay. I'll give you a softball one. <laughs> Is the uh, new baseball stadium going to be a metro facility? I. <laughs> Yes, I know. I've, I've been reading those same articles. Wouldn't that be fun to bring in a, a professional um, baseball um, program? That that would be something to discuss. I even have an idea where I'd like to see it put. Mm. Okay, so let's start with what he first said. I'm going to give you a softball question. Did you mean that? To get to the baseball question? There you are. Okay. <laughs> Another question? <clears throat> Hi, Shirley. Um, I've worked with Betty for a number of years uh, with respect to affordable housing or housing that is affordable or housing that isn't affordable that's intended to be affordable. <clears throat> and I think there's much of the latter. Um, I think it's great that Metro is working on this bond. I think the uh, constitutional change is uh, critical if you're going to truly get affordable housing because the systems that have been delivering quote unquote affordable housing uh, have too many barriers and too many obstacles to overcome uh, with respect to labor rates and bureaucracies and capital stacks and the way they have to deliver. <clears throat> I haven't read the ballot measure and I haven't read the the um, amendment, uh, constitutional amendment. But it is critical that the supply chain um, be available to other producers other than the typical uh, housing authorities and, and bureaucracies that have been in charge of developing affordable housing that isn't affordable. When you spend $400,000 a unit, on affordable housing. There's something clearly wrong with that picture. So, um, and, the and the question is, how do you, how do you 
uh, within this m measure and constitutional amendment, how do you open the playing field uh, to the marketplace so that truly affordable housing can be produced? So, um, thank you for that question. Um, so there's three, several things that are occurring simultaneously. Um, First of all, right now, we're working with the stakeholders and the housing stakeholders in the region to, to figure out how these funds would be distributed. Metro does not build housing. We don't plan or want to be a housing provider. But what the value that we can bring to the region is that be able to raise the funds to be able to have funding available. And also then, those funds would allow us to build housing throughout the entire region and not continue to concentrate it in some areas. So they're looking at uh, th three ways that the funding would be distributed. One of them, it, some of that money would go to the housing authorities, like for Multnomah County it is home forward, but each county would be to receive, each housing authority in each county, Clackamas and Washington, would also receive some funds. But another share of those funds would go to the nonprofits, and those we recognize, those nonprofits that build housing, are really the ones that really can make it happen. They, are, they, they have amazing ability to build efficiently, effectively, really good housing, uh, uh, um, and a, a product that you really think brings value to the community. And, but then the third um, option is that the, some of the funds would go directly back to some of the cities. And they would use those funds to, if, they, if they wanted to, to choose to upgrade current housing that's already in existence. And so that, that money would be divided uh, in three ways. Right now we're working on that distribution formula because we want to make sure it's fair and we want the public to know how the money will be distributed because we've heard a lot of criticism about the Portland housing bond measure that they didn't have that figured out and now they're, they're, they're now looking at trying to figure that out and it's been over, well over a year since the measure was passed. We want the housing built within five to seven years. So all those things are part of the, of the measure. We also then are going to have two versions of the measure, one if the amendment the constitutional amendment change, uh, changes, and one if it doesn't. We sure hope that we can get the public support to change, to, to change that constitutional amendment, but we can't be guaranteed, guaranteed that. So that's, the, that's what we're doing. Thank you. I was just going to add, well, somebody will go to our transit oriented development program so we can buy land and do some banking. Thank you, yes, land banking, yes. But, you know, Brian served on the board of Home Forward for many years and, and led the work on our real estate and development committee, so he's seen it from the inside out developer himself, and he's right, there are two schools of thought right now in terms of cost. You know, can you build it cheaper, but will it last longer? Some of the stuff in terms of the funding sources you leverage have certain requirements around, um, you know, the, the kinds of people that you have to employ, attorneys, tax credit consultants, lawyers, and, 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 uh, and even using bully wages because, they, you know, they're theoretically giving people living wage jobs. There's a lot of conversation on the table right now about how we can do this more efficiently and more cost effectively. And I think, you know, some of that work was done by Meyer Memorial Trust, um, but it hasn't really trickled down. So your concern is legitimate, Brian, and I'm hoping that maybe we can figure out a way how to address that so that we really can get more units on the ground. Thank Let's you. give Shirley a wonderful round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Okay, um, before I close, Brian, I'm going to give you a chance to change what you said. You introduced Shirley as an old neighbor. What you meant was a neighbor you've had for a long time. Is that correct? Let your imagination run <laughs> Okay. I'm trying to get him out of hot water since he doesn't live there anymore. I want to thank our sponsors one more time, Riverview Community Bank and Portland General Electric. Dean, thank you for being here today. Dean, by the way, will get introduced next month as a new board member to the Gresham Chamber. Gresham Barlow, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm really happy about that. Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media. Don't forget to pick up your flyer so you can hear this again and make sure that all the campaign promises were kept. Just kidding. Um, uh, we have our next BLT, our next Business and Leaders Luncheon is May 15th, and we're going to have Maria Pope here. She's the CEO, the new CEO of, the Port of Portland General Electric. She's of the Pope Talbot family from before, so she's got business in her brain. Um, Dean, thank you for making arrangements for her to be here. That'll be May. In June, we're going to be all about body cameras. Our Gresham police are getting a, a grant to have body cameras, and they're going to come. Uh, Sergeant Claudio Grandjohn is going to be here showing us 
maybe showing us how they work. So we'll need some volunteers. Some of you can commit a crime so he can body camera. Yeah, so there we go. Don't forget to fill out your um, the uh, forms, the evaluation forms that are on the table. With that being said, thank you very much for coming today. Bye-bye.